Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd on the Street and this is my full review of Yode. As a quick disclaimer, like I mentioned in my previous video, Yode did send me this Xiaomi Mi 10T for free in exchange for covering their project, but they did not restrict what I can or cannot say about them or their products. Okay everyone, we left off in my last video over a month ago, and I was just getting started with this Yode phone. Over the last month, I have learned a lot about Yode and even a few new things about Android. Let's start with that convention I went to. I took the phone to the convention because I knew I was going to be taking pictures, navigating with maps, probably checking Discord and Telegram, maybe browsing Twitter or Reddit, all in the course of hanging out at that convention for a weekend. It's one of the best places I could have taken the phone to test it out. As I mentioned, aside from things like spelling mistakes or unprofessional text in default apps, the first tangible issue I ran into with the phone was navigation. Yode OS ships with the Magic Earth app, which is proprietary, but uses OpenStreetMap for its data source. As I covered last time, OpenStreetMap doesn't include the location of a board game shop I wanted to go to, and its location for my workplace is years out of date, so one of the first things I did was I installed Google Maps on the phone. And by the way, I know some people's reaction to that is going to be, OpenStreetMaps is open source, just add the missing locations to it so you can prove it for everyone else. And that's a great philosophy. I totally get that philosophy when it comes to open source software. I have made videos in the past showing myself hacking on projects and tracking down bugs to help open source software. But when it comes to a map, that doesn't work for a very simple reason. If it's not on the map, I don't know where it is. So I can't add it to the map without looking up where it is on another app first anyway. And if I'm going to do that, then yeah, I'm going to be relying on the other app that actually has information on the places I want to go. And I'm not going to bother trying to navigate with Magic Earth or OpenStreetMap. Now, one quirk I noticed about Google Maps was that every time I opened it, I got a notification that Google Play services needed to be updated. That notification was popping up because the phone doesn't have Google Play services. It just has the open source micro G replacements. But Google Maps still worked fine. I mentioned this to the Yode team and they said it was expected, but the notification popping up all the time, basically anytime I opened Google Maps and then also randomly in the middle of using Google Maps was really annoying. Um, I was able to stop that from happening though by long pressing on the notification and just turning that particular notification type off at the system level. So Google Maps is still complaining in the background, but I don't hear about it anymore. So I used Google Maps to get to that convention and the day it started, I did eventually start taking pictures like I said I would do. And one of the first things that happened was the camera app started to freeze when I took a picture. It would freeze, it would sit there for a couple of minutes after I tried to take a picture. And when I eventually closed it and opened it back up, the picture was gone, it was not saving. Now the default camera app included in Yode OS is called Open Camera, but Yode has forked Open Camera on their GitLab organization and they apply some patches to it. One of the patches is enabling raw images and one of the ways I can reliably recreate this bug is having raw enabled, either saving the image to both JPEG and raw or setting it to just raw. In either of those cases, if you try to save a photo in raw with Open Camera on the Xiaomi Mi 10T, your camera app will crash and you will lose the picture. It will not save in raw or in JPEG if if you have both enabled. I figured that out at the convention and I turned raw off in the settings, but even though I got it to take a couple pictures after that, it still started freezing again later. So the issue is consistent with raw enabled and it's intermittent with raw disabled. Now I really cannot stress how big of a problem that is. The camera is one of a smartphone's most important features. Aside from making internet access more universal, one of the biggest ways that smartphones have impacted our society is by putting a camera in everybody's pocket being able to take pictures and videos of anything, anywhere, 24 seven. And when you take out your phone to snap a quick photo, you need to know that the photo is going to save because you might be taking a picture of something really important happening or just of a once in a lifetime moment that will never happen again. I opened an issue about this on Yode's GitLab organization. They acknowledged that they enabled the camera API version two in their fork, which makes raw mode available. And they also acknowledged that raw mode is broken on the Mi 10T. That was over a month ago and they still have an update any further on that issue page and they are still shipping a camera app that loses your photos on a phone that they are selling. So that weekend of the convention, after the first day, I came home really pissed about that issue and I started trying to find another camera app. Between both the Google Play Store via the Aurora Store app and the F-Droid repositories, I figured it should be easy to find an alternative camera app. And boy, was I wrong. I'm going to cut to my desk really quick and just run through the problems I found with a bunch of different camera apps. 
All right, guys, so here we are at my desk, and I've tried to position my tripod and my lighting in this video to be better than the last one. I saw that the light was kind of glaring off the screen of the phone in the unboxing video. So this should be a better view for you guys, and here we have the phone. I'll go ahead and turn it on. I mentioned in the last video I don't like that this phone has its fingerprint sensor on the side instead of the back, but one thing that is nice about it, at least when you're recording a video about the phone, is that you can use the fingerprint sensor while it's sitting on the desk flat like that. So let's take a look at some camera apps here. So the first camera app that I tried was obviously the one that shipped on the phone and that is open camera. I'm gonna have to pick the phone up here so that you can actually see the viewfinder a little bit. We're going to use this flash drive as something to take pictures of as an example. And let me go ahead and just delete some of these old pictures. Uh, just to make what's going on here more clear. All right, so the last picture I took on here, I was taking some test pictures a long time ago of uh, the keyboard on my desk, and we're gonna take some pictures of the flash drive just to test out how open camera works here. So let's go ahead and, well, just to start with, we can, we can take a photo. I'm gonna hit the photo button, and it saved that time, okay. Like I said, when you don't have RAW enabled, it will usually save, it seems like. Although I, I definitely figured out through troubleshooting that RAW was what was causing my problems while I was walking around at that convention trying to take pictures, and I turned RAW off and was still seeing some freezes. Now, to show you the freezes I'm getting, if we come in here to the settings and then the photo settings, there is an option called RAW. And we can tap that. We've got options for standard and DNG or just DNG. DNG being the RAW format. So let's try setting this to DNG. We wanna take our pictures in RAW mode. We're gonna come back out here to the camera and let's try to take a picture of this flash drive. I'm gonna go ahead and delete the old photo once again that we just took. So we want a photo of the flash drive. Focus, looks good. I'll take the photo. All right, so what we have right now, I can take the flash drive out of the frame. You can see that the viewfinder is stuck. Um, and we, we've got the indicator up here uh, that says that it was supposed to take in RAW, but we don't have any message right now saying anything about RAW. When I figured out that this issue had to do with RAW photos, I had to do that with troubleshooting. I said, okay, well, what are some of the options I've changed so far? Let me go and try turning those off one at a time and seeing if the camera app starts working again. But there is no error message here that would be helpful to identify the cause of this issue. You know, a regular user who is just trying to take photos, maybe it's a photographer who doesn't know a lot about computers but knows about photos, so they wanna take photos in RAW. They're going to try and take a photo and they're going to see that it freezes after they turned RAW on. They might not even think that turning RAW on is what caused the issue. They may just give up at this point or think that something is majorly broken, which I would describe this as being majorly broken. As you can see, we, we still have a zoom slider here and we can actually move that zoom slider and we get text as if it's letting us zoom for some reason. I can continue hitting the shutter button and it actually lights up a little bit. Um, I can actually open up the settings again and come back out. And when I do that, the preview is gone. And if we go into our camera roll here, uh, you can see I've still just got the photos that I took of the keyboard a long time ago, um, and I don't have the photo of the flash drive we just tried to take. I can do that again, take a photo of the flash drive, once again, take the flash drive away, and it's just sitting here. If I close the camera app and go back into it, once again, that preview just disappears, we lose the photo. Um, and once again, if we set this to what I had actually set it to was standard and raw so that you get a regular JPEG and a raw version. And with this one, you might think that it would at least save the JPEG version uh, if it loses the raw version, but we can once again, set the flash drive here and take a photo and it's going to sit there, take the flash drive away uh, and we can, you know, we can go into our multitasking view here and go back into the camera app um, and it actually does not save the JPEG. So. Um, if you try to enable RAW at all, it will just completely break your camera. Once again, this is not acceptable for them to have this option in the app. If it's going to be broken on this phone, then this option should not be available on this phone. If they're selling this phone, you know, they might say, oh, well, we can't have the option available for some phones, but not for others. That sounds like a distribution problem that you need to solve if you're going to be shipping phones where this is broken, because it, you either need to turn off RAW for all the phones if it's not gonna work on some of them, or you need to figure out how to not ship a feature on a phone where it's not supported. This is really a basic usability thing. Now, um, if I set down the phone on the desk here, you can see that on the top left, there's some text in the viewfinder. Um, I actually don't like the open camera app that much personally, even when it does work. Um, and if we set it down, you can see some of the information here. I mean, how many users out there taking pictures with a smartphone camera who don't use RAW and don't know what that is and don't care that it's broken, how many regular users are going to know what an ISO value is or how to use that ISO value 
for something useful? How many users are going to be taking a look at the shutter speed and using that information in any way? You know, um, we've, got, we've got a tiny little battery meter there. We've got a clock and those things would show up if you just didn't hide the top bar in the camera app. Uh, but instead they shove it down here in our viewfinder, which is it's over the viewfinder. So it's covering up things that you're trying to take a picture of. Uh, but once again, if we take a picture with raw off and it sometimes saves, it saved this time, you know, there is no text there. There is no text in the corner of the photo. So this is an inaccurate preview since the preview includes text that's not gonna be in the actual photo. We've also got in the bottom left, we've got this zoom slider that once again overlaps the viewfinder, but only a little bit. And that looks really bad. It looks like a really messy, really amateur app. And to be clear, the Open Camera app is an open source application and it's actually a very robust application that a lot of professional photographers prefer over stock Android camera apps because it's got so many cool features or so many technical features that photographers can use to better tweak their photos that they're taking. And that's all great. Um, but for, for a regular user who's not going to be using all those features, you know, the app looks really bad. And even for photographers, you know, they would probably also prefer if the app looked a little nicer over not looking nicer, as long as it doesn't take away any of the features that they want to use. Some other problems with the UI here, just to point them out, um, you know, the shutter button down here, it's got this gap over it. The shutter button is aligned to the bottom of the screen. I don't know why we're showing the buttons at the bottom of the screen if we're not showing the status bar by default. But yeah, we've just got this awkward gap that tapping it does absolutely nothing. We've got these two buttons to the side of the shutter button, which we've also got the video button to switch between picture and video, and that extends the viewfinder. Um, once again, putting some other things on top of the viewfinder. But yeah, here in picture mode, um, we've got these icons here, and one of them is going to switch us to the front-facing camera mode, and you can see there's me and there's the tripod I'm recording this video with. But these buttons, I don't know what they were thinking with putting these two buttons here, um, because they're not lined up. I mean, if this top button, which what does this top button even do? That changes the camera ID that you're using. Um, this top button that does absolutely nothing when you're using the front facing camera, you just tap that button and it shows you the same lens every time. So that shouldn't even be there in this view. But when it is there, you know, if it was, if it was just lower down so that it was right on top of the camera switching button, then they would at least be lined up aesthetically with the shutter button. Um, instead, we've got this thing where it's like halfway between the bottom button and the viewfinder. Um, so it just doesn't match the shutter button at all. It's almost like they were going for like a triangle thing here, but it, it does not look good. Um, so if we switch this back, I also want to call out, uh, once again, this button on the back camera switches between two IDs for the back camera. I mean, we can set the flash drive down here to get an idea of what's going on here. So this is camera ID zero. This is camera ID two. So we've got zero and two, and there's not much difference there. You might be able to tell that two is kind of a little bit washed out or blurry. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell in the preview there uh, on, on the camera, the frame rate's definitely a lot lower, but camera two is actually a macro view. Um, so if we take a look back here, we've got the largest camera on the back of the phone is camera ID zero. Then we've got a telephoto lens, and then we've also got a macro view. Now, open camera actually does not expose the telephoto lens on this phone at all, which once again, this is a phone that Yode is selling, so they have this in their, in their lab, uh, and they have this to, to tweak settings for their default apps with. But yeah, I've looked through the settings and I couldn't find anything in open camera to select other lenses to be made available. Uh, we've just got ID zero is the main back camera, uh, ID one is the front camera, and then ID two is the macro camera. Once again, that's, that's macro, so it's not actually doing anything very different from the main camera. Um, it's just theoretically the lens will focus a little bit closer. So this default open camera app left a lot to be desired. For one thing, it actually doesn't work and it loses your photos if you've got certain features like raw enabled. For another thing, it looks pretty bad. Oh, and another thing, these, these, this row of icons at the top, um, I mean, it's okay that they've got this menu is a mess. Why, <laughs> that's a really arbitrary size. I cannot uh, resize or move this menu at all. But if I go and I go to the on-screen GUI section, let's say I turn on some more features and I actually did this. Um, I, I didn't turn on all the features like this, but I turned on a few more. If we go back now, it doesn't split those into multiple rows or anything with all of this wasted space. It doesn't use any of that space. Instead, it just makes all the buttons tiny. This app looks really bad. 
and then it also doesn't expose all of the lenses on the phone. So we're going to go beyond open camera at this point. I said, okay, I need a different camera app. What are my options? Here are a few of the ones that I tried. One of the more popular ones in the Play Store is called Secure Camera, and I think it's this one right here. So Secure Camera is the default camera in another operating system called Graphene OS. Um, and I appreciate that they're putting their default camera app that they're developing in-house into the Play Store for everyone else to use as well. So this camera, as you can see, it's also a little bit weird on the UI side. We've got a lot of space in this one on the bottom of the phone. Um, I appreciate that they're trying to do something about balancing out with the viewfinder and not just randomly throwing buttons on the screen like open camera does. Now, Secure Camera does have some UI quirks similar to Open Camera. They're not as bad, uh, but as you can see, we've got a button at the top that opens up these settings here, and then we've got a More Settings button to open up more settings. We don't have a lot of settings available in this particular app. Um, now, this button at the top to open that settings dropdown, if we happen to bring our status bar into view, then that, that button to get to the camera app settings is just gone, and we can't, we can't get it back. Tapping here, the status bar is still showing that I pulled down. I still can't get to the settings. I have to wait here for the status bar to hide itself, if it's even gonna do that at all. And it doesn't seem like the status bar is gonna go away by itself. So I have to get out of the app, go back into it. We've still just got the status bar. So I can't get to the settings. Once again, the problem is I cannot access the settings in Secure Camera here. Um, so I'm going to get out of it, go back in. Okay, so now we don't have the status bar. Now we can get to the, the drop down here. Um, so that's annoying right there. As you can see, the viewfinder is overlapping the camera and it's also unnecessarily pushed to the top of the screen so it's being cut off by the, the rounded corners of the screen. Now aside from that, as you can see, I, I've taken some pictures with Secure Camera and it does work. We can set our flash drive down here, take a picture of it, and it actually saves pictures, which is an improvement over open camera. It does not give us the option to enable RAW, so there is no way we can break this particular app. But yeah, not being able to get to the settings once you have pulled the, the status bar down at all is kind of a, an issue. Um, once again, I can, I can switch between the front and back cameras, but there is no option to use any of the alternate cameras in secure camera. Um, I can switch over to video mode, and once again, at that point, we've got uh, the buttons overlapping the viewfinder again, and then once again, empty space at the bottom of the screen just not being used at all. Um, and Secure Camera is developed for another OS, and it's not tweaked to this particular phone, so I don't hold that against the creators of Secure Camera necessarily, but, um, but it's not a super optimal experience here. But that was one of the options. Not being able to get to the settings was really annoying, so I moved on to looking for other options. Oh, and another thing about Secure Camera, it was also, my notes say that it was kind of slow. Now it's not being very slow right now. Um, oh yeah, if I take a couple pictures, you can say it says, please wait for the last image to get processed. But yeah, it, it's not being super slow right now. That might have to do with the lighting I've got. I've got really good lighting right now for the video. Sometimes it was slow, at least earlier on, trying to save photos. So Secure Camera was not quite up to the task for me, UI-wise or feature-wise, and so I went looking for more, maybe, professional apps. I was willing to pay for apps. You know, obviously, if I'm gonna pay for an app, I would want to know that it's going to work well. One of the ones I tried was called First Light, and it's by Filmic, which also makes some other apps. Filmic Pro, I think, is their flagship camera app, but First Light, we can try to open that up here, and as you can see, this one doesn't even open. It says, Unknown Source Detected. App installed from an unknown source. Are you migrating from another device? If so, please install First Light again from Google Play. If we tap Google Play, we can open that link with Aurora Store and it goes to First Light and we've already got First Light installed here from Aurora Store. We happen to have an update available. I can go ahead and install that. All right, so that's been installed from the Aurora Store and if we open it up, once again, unknown source detected. Because we're not actually installing it from Google Play, it's not gonna find the Google Play services running here. Whatever Micro G is emulating is not enough for Filmic First Light here. Um, so we just can't use the app. If I tap cancel, it just closes. You know, I can come in here to our app drawer again. I can try to open it up. Unknown source detected, cancel, it closes. So literally cannot use that app on Yode OS because we're missing actual Google Play. Which means that the Micro G replacements that Yode is shipping are not doing their jobs well enough. The next one I tried was called Camera FV5, and this is another semi-professional one. I think it's right here. Yes, and this one was okay. This, this camera app had a decent UI, UX. Uh, once again, you know, we've got some balance issues with how much blank space is above the viewfinder versus below. Uh, but if I set my flash drive here, you know, this is a, a decent app. I've got the grid turned on right now. You can turn that on or off really easily. 
uh, or you can, I guess, we're not turning it on or off. Uh, a long press on it is to turn it completely off. Um, and then you can switch it between a lot of different fancy camera grid options. But yeah, we can, we can line up a photo, take the photo. It used a flash that time. Let me turn flash off. That just turns the flashlight on. Okay, so yeah, this one fairly quick at processing. Um, so all of that's fine. We can come in here to the camera roll. It seems to be saving photos, so that's good. The biggest problem I had with this one was that if we go into our settings here, our image resolution right now is 1920 by 1440, so just over 1080p. Uh, I'm used to my photos being a lot higher resolution than that. And this phone's camera, the Xiaomi Mi 10T, has a much higher resolution camera than that. However, if we open up this settings menu here, 1920 by 1440 is the highest we can go. Uh, and as you can see, it's offering to have us buy a pro version of camera FE5 to unlock all of the resolutions. So I can tap on that. Um, I can open that up with the Aurora store. As you can see, this costs $5. Now, if I try to download this here, it's gonna say app not purchased, download failed. In the Aurora store on Yode, you can't actually make purchases. However, if I wanted to go to play.google.com, purchase the app in my web browser on my computer or on the phone, and then come back to the Aurora store, then I would be able to download it. However, I'm not very confident doing that because once again, if that app happens to have any sort of license checking, like First Light did, you know, First Light refuses to run. So I don't feel confident purchasing camera FV5 Pro or whatever they call the non-light, I guess it's just camera FV5, but not the light version. Uh, but I don't feel confident making that purchase knowing that I might not be able to use it on this phone. I also think it's interesting, some apps, uh, you know, oh, now it's offering to open it with the Aurora store. You saw the first time I tapped that link, it offered to open it in F-Droid and F-Droid just says no such app found because that's a proprietary app that's not in the F-Droid repositories. So yeah, camera FV5 was almost there, but unfortunately I, I don't want, you know, if there were other features that they were limiting to the pro version, then maybe I would just stick with the free version. But resolution, I'm not going to limit the usefulness and the future-proofness of my photos by taking them at a lower resolution. Um, so camera FV5 was out for me because I didn't know if the paid version would actually work or not. Another one I tried here is called camera X. We can open that one up. Now, Camera X is interesting. As you can see, we've got um, a few different options down here at the bottom. I can go to the regular photo mode. And this camera app actually looks okay. Out of all of the camera apps that I've looked at, this one, the UI is actually probably the nicest looking simply because they managed to center these buttons in the empty space and there's not extra empty space somewhere else. The viewfinder is still sort of off center, but the cameras on the phone are off center. They're at the top of the screen. So the viewfinder being towards the top makes sense. Uh, there's nothing behind the status bar and the status bar actually goes away when you're done using it. So, you know, UI wise, this, this app is fine. As you can see, once again, I was taking pictures of my keyboard previously to test, but I can take a picture of the flash drive. It actually saves. Um, it does take a minute to actually process. I don't know if it's going to go ahead and finish saving. There we go. So a little bit slow with the saving there on camera X, but but it did save eventually, so that's what counts. Now, something interesting about Camera X is we can actually go into the settings and we can turn RAW on. We can turn on RAW plus JPEG right here. And if we do that, uh, it will actually still save the photo. So I can take a photo, or actually just to make it look different, I can take a photo of this flash drive vertical. It's against the grain of the desk now. I could take that photo and it saves. Uh, once again, the preview saves almost immediately. Um, Oh, it looks like it did save the actual photo that time pretty quickly. So yeah, turning RAW on in Camera X does not completely break saving photos, which is good. Now Camera X, uh, once again, if we come into our settings here, there's an option to remove ads and tapping that just doesn't work. As you can see, it's trying to open up some screen. Um, I can actually, I can see more of it in my, my video camera's viewfinder because it's got a lower FPS than my eyes do but I assume it's opening up some sort of, uh, oh, it says right here at the bottom, there was an error connecting with Google Play. So it's trying to open up a page where we can make an in-app purchase, but we don't have the option to do that once again because we don't have Google Play. Um, and once again, that makes me less confident in buying camera FE5 for the non-light version because there are at least two other camera apps that don't work properly without Google Play. Now, even though I don't have the option to remove ads, uh, I don't see any ads anywhere. And I, I think that's because of the Yode app, the Yode firewall blocking ads. And I'll cover that more later in the video, that whole phenomenon. Um, I did note down in my notes 
that camera X can crash sometimes when you're switching to certain modes, such as fast mode here. I tried to switch to fast mode and now camera X is just sitting here. Once again, if I'm taking a picture of something, the reason I care about every single button on the screen not being able to crash the camera um, is because of this. Because you might be able to say, oh, Jacob, you know, just don't touch that option if you know that option is gonna crash the camera app. If everything else about the app works, then just don't use that option. The problem is if I'm, if I'm holding my phone and I'm trying to take a picture and I'm, you know, I'm out in a real world location where I am having to give attention to other things around me and not just my phone, my finger might accidentally brush that item, that option on the screen. The button that breaks the app, I might accidentally tap it. And if I do that, then I can't quickly recover. Now I have to close the app and I have to go and open it back up. And this is time that I'm losing and I might have at this point lost whatever it was that I was trying to take a picture of. Um, so yeah, the fact that camera X also crashes when I try to switch to that fast motion option, I don't know what this option even does, but that is a deal breaker that it freezes on that. So camera X doesn't work. Let's take a look at a couple other ones. There's one called Ultra Pixel that I tried. It's down here under U Ultra Pixel. Okay, so this app looks really fancy. We can go to the camera here and the shutter is underneath the home button and the home button is not hiding itself. So that right there is a UX problem and that is a deal breaker because I might accidentally exit the app when I'm trying to hit the shutter. We've got another one called Pictica. Pictica is right here and this one has an okay looking UI. Uh, they've got a level there built in, which is, is kind of nice. This one does manage to take photos. However, once again, there's a button at the top middle of the screen here in Pictica and this one, you can see the resolution is limited. I'm locked at 12. If I try to go to resolution 13, it asks me to buy a license. And the license buying page with this stupid TikTok-esque advertisement auto-playing, uh, there are no prices listed and trying to tap one of these doesn't work because they're unable to contact Google. Uh, so once again, that's something else. This app will not work on Yode because Yode does not include Google Play. So that one's out. We've been through like seven apps now that don't work as expected for camera apps. How hard can it be to find a freaking camera app? You know, I was asking myself at this point, what am I missing? Where am I not looking in the right place here? Now, everything that I looked at so far was from the Aurora store, uh, but I actually said, okay, well, this isn't working. Why don't I take a look at F-Droid? Because F-Droid apps probably won't be depending on Google. The problem with F-Droid is that it doesn't really include that many camera apps. One of the only ones it does include is Open Camera, which I've already got installed anyway. And the Open Camera app from Yode is overwriting in the repositories uh, the default open camera app. If I come in here and search for open camera, you can see the open camera, I don't know what F-Droid is doing in terms of their search because it's not the first result that comes up. When I search open camera, the actual open camera app is off the first page of results. It's at, it's at the top of the second page. Um, and the only version here that we have installed or available at all is the Yode version. If we keep scrolling down there, I don't see any other versions of open camera. Some of the other few camera apps in F-Droid are super old. They were made for older versions of Android. I actually did find one camera app that did work from F-Droid and that was called Simple Camera. It's this orange icon right here. This is the one I ended up using for the rest of that convention and its pictures are okay. I, I'm not sure if they're the best pictures but I can set my flash drive down there and you know, this is a, this is a good UI. You know, once again, it's not utilizing the top of the screen where the screen is rounded so you actually, you don't get your corners cut off in your preview. We do have a few buttons overlaying the viewfinder, but we also have a full screen viewfinder here and that's why that's happening. And these buttons are, you know, they're very clear. And I think I actually turned on the option to keep them visible. Um, otherwise they do go away by themselves after a little while. Yeah, as you can see, they, they kind of go away by default. And then we've got the shutter button at the bottom um, and it's perfectly centered on the screen, you know, vertically, horizontally between the home button and the viewfinder, perfectly fine. I can switch the front camera, switch back to the back camera. The flash icon only shows up for the back camera because it knows that the front one doesn't have a flash. Um, and I can set that to on, auto or off. I can take a picture, it actually saves, which I can see in the camera roll here. So that's all wonderful. I'm gonna turn the settings buttons back on. So what's the problem with this one? Well, um, as you can see, let's do that again. I'm actually going to move the flash drive so it's just out of frame here. And let's move it so that the, we're gonna take a picture so that the black plastic piece of the flash drive is the last thing in the frame. So I just took that photo. If we go to the actual photo, you can see that it's got extra space at the edge. 
um, and it gets a little blurrier at the edge maybe. But yeah, the problem with simple camera is that it actually takes photos at the full resolution, but it doesn't let you preview the full resolution. The preview is locked at this, this size that auto expands to fill your entire screen, uh, which to their credit, simple camera, I actually looked up their GitHub page because this is an open source app and it, it's a little bit old and it's no longer maintained. And so maybe phones didn't have aspect ratios this tall because I mentioned this phone is taller than my OnePlus 5T was. It's the same width, but it's taller. So this aspect ratio probably wasn't as common back when simple camera was being developed. Uh, but once again, this was kind of an issue. I used this one at the convention, but it was annoying not actually knowing what the edges of the photo would be because there was some times that I was actually trying to, you know, I, I was having to back up to get the whole whatever I was trying to take a picture of in the frame and I wasn't getting an accurate picture. I just had to guess or take a picture and see if I had backed up far enough or if I need to keep going uh, because the edges of the preview were cut off. So once again, at this point, I'm like, how hard can this be? I started getting a little bit more desperate and I was like, you know what? I miss my OnePlus 5T camera. The OnePlus camera always just worked. The one that was built into Oxygen OS that OnePlus shipped. And so I had an idea. I was like, I wonder if I can download an APK of that. I wonder if anyone has posted that to XDA developers or anything. So I just did a web search of OnePlus camera app download and I found some of those. And we can open one up here. This is the OnePlus camera that I have installed. This looks pretty much exactly like it does. Uh, on my OnePlus 5T. It's actually a newer version of the OnePlus camera. So it's got some extra features that I didn't have on the 5T. Um, but yeah, this I, I wanted the f camera to work just how my other one did. And this one got so close. You know, we've got some options here. Um, since this is a camera that OnePlus is shipping on their phones, there's not gonna be weird ads uh, or extra features that you have to purchase premium in-app purchases to unlock. Um, you know, this is just gonna work. We can bring this up here to the selfie cam. We can take a picture, it saves, which is great. We can open that up. It's gonna ask us uh, what gallery we wanna use and there we, there we have that picture. So that was looking like it was gonna work really well. The problem with this one, if we go to slow motion, it freezes the app once again. And what if I'm trying to take a picture of something you know, action that's happening, but I accidentally hit slow motion. Now the camera app's frozen. Now I'm wasting precious seconds closing it, reopening it. It's still stuck. I, this one, I actually have to go into multitasking view, entirely dismiss it. I can go ahead and close the rest of these uh, and then open it back up. And then so the slow motion option just doesn't work at all on the OnePlus camera app. It was so close. I would have stuck with this if it didn't freeze when I selected slow motion, uh, but it did freeze. So I could not use that. So I was like, okay, the OnePlus camera app doesn't work. This is a Xiaomi phone. Maybe I should get the Xiaomi camera app. So I found that one. It's called ANX Cam or ANX Camera. We can open that up and this one actually works okay as well. Um, as you can see, the UI on this one, notice that all the camera apps that manufacturers ship actually look decent. Notice that they, they move most of the buttons off of the viewfinder. There's some stuff on the viewfinder sometimes, yeah, but you don't have a bunch of random text, a bunch of tiny little text. It's just, this is a zoom indicator that we can tap to go between different zoom levels. Um, and there's one of the crashes that I have with ANX Cam, um, is that if I try to zoom below one times, which how could you zoom out less than 100%? Um, I'll explain it in a minute. But ANX Cam, this is Xiaomi's official camera app on a Xiaomi phone and it's crashing uh, when I try to zoom out smaller than 100%. Now the other problem with ANX Camera is that when you take a photo, uh, that app freezes. It says can't connect to camera and then it closes and when you open it back up, the photo is gone. Once again, just like open camera, it does not save when it freezes. So this is the Xiaomi camera app on a Xiaomi phone and it freezes when I try to take a picture too. So that one is out. And at this point I was thinking, okay, the OnePlus camera worked better than the Xiaomi camera, but it still had issues. And I, I tried to think, what are people using who know Android? You know, like professional photographers, sure, are gonna use open camera. What are professional Android developers using? Or what are Android experts using? And obviously the flagship Android phones are the Google Pixel phones. And they have Google's camera app, which everybody knows that Google Pixel phones, one of their best features are how great the cameras are, how good of pictures they take, which is something that, you know, iPhones take excellent pictures, uh, but Google came along and they, they gave great pictures to people. And instead of using really high quality lenses, they used affordable lenses, and then they have a bunch of post-processing in the camera app to make the picture look really good. Um, and so I figured, okay, I wonder if people are out there putting the Google camera app onto other phones. And sure enough, there's a whole community of people doing that. And I found one version of the Google camera app. It's right here. Um, and this is, this is the Google camera app. 
Um, now I'm gonna switch to the One X Zoom here. So the Google Camera app actually seemed to work pretty well when I got it. Uh, we do have a settings drop down here. It sort of looks like Secure Camera did, uh, except it's a little bit lower so it doesn't get covered up by that status bar. But yeah, we can come into more settings and we've got lots of lots of settings uh, and this is a Gcam build. And there's lots of different people taking Google Camera and attempting to package it. That just opened up the developer's Facebook page there. Uh, but yeah, this, this app actually worked decently well. I can take a picture and it saves. Um, now, if I try to open that up, some of the Google Camera app APKs out there that you'll find, the camera roll only works if you have the Google Photos app installed. Some of them have been modified, such as this build, to not require that. Um, as you can see, I can switch between all the different options here, all the different modes in Google Camera, um, and it's not crashing. This is actually a camera app that none of the modes are crashing the camera, so that's great. Uh, the one problem with this particular build of, of Google Camera that I got was that um, as you can see, there's a, a 0.6x view here. Um, or there's a 0.6x button, and if I tap that, once again, I'm going to take the flash drive, I'm going to line the camera up so the edges of the flash drive are at the edges of the viewfinder. I'm going to tap 0.6x, and it actually gives me like another inch of space on either side of the flash drive in the viewfinder. How is it doing that? This phone has a telephoto lens, like I mentioned earlier. Google Camera is the only camera app out of all the camera apps that actually showed me the telephoto lens option and worked when I was trying to use that option. Now some of the Google Camera apps actually crashed if I switched between the different camera modes too quickly or in the wrong order. At this particular moment, this Google Camera app is, uh, this build is working. Google Camera apps on non-Google phones are also tricky because you have to basically tweak the settings with an XML file to match your lenses and things. Um, and you know, you can find other people that have already put out an XML file for the Xiaomi Mi 10T for Google Camera, but you're never quite sure what the quality of the settings that you're downloading are going to be. Um, so the camera app that I ended up landing on, once again, I can't recreate the crash of this normal Google Camera app right now. It was crashing before. It's a little bit later after the last recording. I just got this to crash. Let me see if I can make this happen again. All right, so wide lens, one times lens, macro lens. Going from wide to macro, back to wide. I just made it happen. It only happens off camera. It only happens off camera. There it goes. All right, there's the crash. Um, but the camera app I ended up going with, it's one called Butcher Cam, and it's a Google camera app distribution published by a developer whose, whose pin name or whose developer name, their username online is Butcher. And yeah, this is another one where once again, I've got, I can take a photo of the flash drive here and it saves, which is very important that it actually saves. And then I can also go to the telephoto lens and I can get a lot more space around the flash drive. Now this would have been super helpful at that convention. And it actually, it upset me when I saw that the Google camera apps were giving me this option uh, because the open camera app, once again, the open camera app did not give me this option. The built-in default camera app on the phone and most of the other apps that I tried, all of the apps from the Play Store, the Aurora Store and F-Droid, none of them were really giving me that option to use the telephoto lens. Um, open camera has a button to switch lenses, but it only switches to the macro lens. It doesn't switch to the telephoto lens. And there were absolutely times at that convention when I would walk into a room at the doorway and want to take a picture of what the whole room looks like. But you know, when I would bring my phone up, it would just not quite be capturing the whole thing. And so I'd have to either take a quick video, just sort of panning, or I'd have to try to take a panorama and mess with moving the phone around. And then you got artifacts whenever people are moving. Um, and it would have been so much easier if I had had this option to use the telephoto lens that is on this phone. So it really, it's not great that the default camera and many of the other camera apps available didn't expose all of the lenses on this phone. I am happy that I eventually found this butcher cam build of Google camera that seems to work okay with all the different lenses. Uh, we can also go back to the macro view and you know, once again, that one's more for really close up pictures such as this one that we're taking of the flash drive right now. But yeah, this one, this one's got settings. It's, uh, there was nothing that I could break 
in this particular camera app. So this is the one that I ended up uh, keeping on here. This was after the convention had already ended by the time I found this one. Uh, but you know, if I was going to use this phone for a long period of time, uh, this this weird random butcher cam. My one complaint about this app is that it's got a weird name and a weird icon. If if the icon was just the regular Google camera icon or just any regular camera icon, then I would be happy with it 100%. But the icon says BC because the developer of that Google camera port wanted to throw his initials into the icon. So it just looks weird. It looks it looks off, but it does work. And that is what I ended up going with for the photos, taking them on Yoda OS here. Now I wanna be clear, this camera app is not in the Play Store. You cannot go and download this from the Play Store. Uh, so on Yoda, you cannot download it from the Aurora Store and it's also not open source. It's a port of Google's proprietary app. So you cannot download it from F-Droid either. So I had to go through over 10 camera apps to find one that actually worked. And what I ended up with was a random APK that I downloaded through the web browser. That's not secure, it's not going to be easy to update, it was a huge pain in the butt, and I'm still not sure that the photos I'm taking are going to be optimized for the lenses on this particular phone. Now I did mention this to Yode in an email, aside from that GitLab issue, and I'm not going to show you the entire email because that would be a little rude and unprofessional, but I do wanna quote one part of their response. I actually suggested, hey, this simple camera app on F-Droid is pretty good, but it's discontinued and it's missing the option to have an uncropped viewfinder. Since it's open source, I suggested you guys might wanna take a look at forking this app that looks a lot better and doesn't crash and add the one cosmetic option that it's lacking rather than trying to mess with open camera since it's a lot more complicated. And the response I got back included, quote, we change nothing from open camera about raw option. It works on Samsung S10 series. We don't have enough resources to maintain an app such as simple camera. Even if open camera may not be aesthetically the best, it gets slowly improved and we experience less issues with it than snap we used previously. And there are a couple snap camera apps in the Google Play Store. One of them is free with advertisements and includes a bunch of fancy filters. The other one looks okay, but it's paid. I'm really not sure which one they were talking about. We will make someone work on it if we grow. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and say that if Yode doesn't have the resources to support simple camera, they probably don't have the resources to support open camera either. And that appears to be true since they're still shipping a broken camera app over a month after that issue was reported and they say they'll work on open camera if they grow. So ultimately I had to go outside of the open camera app that Yode shipped, not just because open camera was failing to take photos, but also because open camera didn't give me the option to use the wide angle lens. And if this was a third party device, I would kind of understand that, but this is a phone that Yode is selling. So they have them in house, they test against them and it just doesn't work. And they're okay with that because they've seen it not work worse in the past. So let's just take all of that. That's the camera portion of the review. And we're gonna give that a thumbs down. I'm gonna move on from it now. I wanna talk about the app stores on Yode. Like I mentioned earlier, it comes with the Aurora Store and F-Droid. Aurora Store lets you download apps from Google Play and F-Droid lets you download mainly open source apps from other repositories. Now, Aurora Store had some incredibly unprofessional copy in its first launch wizard, which I didn't even notice until I was editing the unboxing video. Next to their privacy policy, they say, find out if we have your nudes, followed by a stuck out tongue emoji. That is not cute, that is not funny. It actually makes me assume the people developing Aurora Store are extremely childish, and it makes me not very confident in either their programming in the app or their privacy policy. Now beyond the copy, I do appreciate that the Aurora Store is a lot more streamlined than Google Play these days. When I launch Google Play on my old phone, I get Google trying to sell me music from California, TV shows from California, movies from California, and all kinds of other crap that I don't want to see. Google Play is also going to include sponsored app advertisements in browsing and search features. The Aurora Store, on the other hand, it just shows me apps and it basically just shows me the ones I'm looking for. It has your typical charts, the top most downloaded apps in a few different categories, but I can open this app up and search for what I'm looking for with a lot less friction than Google Play, so that's great. Another thing I like about it is the updating experience. Now Google Play a while back actually started automatically updating apps when you're connected to Wi-Fi and power at the same time. And you can turn that feature off and just update your apps manually again, but they actually discouraged that by making it pretty difficult to find where to update your apps in Google Play. So this is my OnePlus 5T running just plain Lineage OS 19, and that's Android 12 
which Android 12, I'm really not a fan of what they're doing with the, the user interface here, but that's not really the point of this video. I can open up the Play Store here, um, and I don't have very many apps installed on this OnePlus 5T yet because I, I just put Lineage OS on it after migrating over to the Yode phone and using that as my daily driver for a few weeks. But in the Google Play app, as you can see, uh, we've got apps, which is what I'm kind of looking for, but I want to see if I have any updates available. Um, so games, movies and TV, books, you know, movies and TV and books are completely off topic for an app store. Um, I, where do I see if there's updates available? There's nothing in the top bar here. There's, there's really, there's nowhere to go. You know, I can try to search. Uh, there's nowhere to see updates. And where you have to go for updates on Google Play is you have to go to your account up here in the top right, which my account, I would expect to see things that I've purchased, but you know, the updates on this particular phone does not have anything to do with my Google account in their cloud, you know? And so I don't like that they buried it here, but it's under your account and then manage apps and device, manage updates available. So we do have three updates available. <laughs> we do. Um, over here, once again, where it's like, it seems like I'm missing something. Like there has to be an easier way to find my updates in Google Play. Um, but yeah, it's manage apps and device, manage, or I guess there's also updates available. You can just tap that and it goes right there. Um, if we go to manage and then updates available, there's not even an, an update all section. You know, I have to, I can tap one checkbox and, uh, and then it's going to update that one app but there's not even, this is an updates page. This is one of the ways you can see your available updates and there is no update all button. So some, I guarantee someone out there who doesn't know the other way to get to this page, at least one person out there is going in every single time they're manually updating every app individually because that's all that this screen lets you do is update every app individually. This is the official Google Play app. Um, once again, if we go back over to overview, if we get to this instead by going to updates available, now magically there is an update all button and we can tap that and it will update the rest of them. So just for comparison, that is what it looks like in the official Google Play app. Um, so that's sort of the bar when it comes to other app stores on Android, especially one like the Aurora Store that is directly replacing the Play Store. Now over on Yode with the Aurora Store, we can open up the app. And at the bottom right here, we've got an updates button. Now for UX purposes, I kept finding myself looking for the updates button in the left sidebar here, which is where your account settings are and there's a my apps and games section that doesn't show you updates. I kept looking for updates over here. So maybe moving that button from the bottom to the sidebar or duplicating that button in the sidebar would be a good idea. But there is a clearly labeled updates button here. And if we tap on that button, we get a list of all of our updates. We can update them all super easily with the update all button, or we can choose a particular app that we want to update here. I am going to update this first one in the list, and this is an app called Obstruct. The wallpaper that I'm using on this phone actually is not a default Yode wallpaper. This is a default OnePlus wallpaper. Uh, the Yode wallpaper is in even the Lineage OS and default wallpapers from AOSP. I don't really like any of those default wallpapers. They seem kind of low quality, but I find that OnePlus makes really nice default wallpapers and the artist of those wallpapers for OnePlus actually put out his own app called Obstruct, which you can use to download those wallpapers easier. They're all in one place. You don't have to go looking for them on the internet. Now, as you can see, I closed the app here. I closed the Aurora store. Oh, it's going back and forth between deciding that it's updating and deciding that it's not. Okay, so now it's, now it's installing. All right, I don't think it always does that. If I tap update on Brave here, will it actually start updating from the list? Or did I just uncover another bug in the process of trying to show you, I do like this interface. This interface is fine. Uh, yeah, no, tapping update does nothing. If I tap update and then I refresh, then it acts like it's not updating. All right, so the individual update does not work. I do know that the update all button works. I'm gonna tap that one. Um, and I know that that one works because I use it fairly often. All right, there we go. So after tapping update all, you can see it is downloading multiple apps in parallel. Right now it's downloading Duo, which is a dual factor authentication app at the same time as Discord. All right, and so now we're going to start getting notifications now that that's kicking in. Um, so individual updates actually not the greatest, but Updating all is, is perfectly fine. Um, now, if I turn the phone off here, if I just 
turn the screen off, you'll hear it continue to give me notifications as it finishes downloading all of those apps. It actually brings the screen back on just to let you know that the apps are done downloading. Um, now, if you don't want to get notifications every time an app is done downloading, you can probably come in and make those notifications silent. Yeah, if we long tap on one, this is what I did with the Google Maps notification that I was getting about Google Play services. If you long press on a notification in Android, uh, you can choose to make it silent or you can turn them off altogether. Um, so if you don't want those notifications, then that's fine. You can do that really easily. But at this point, we can just wait here for a little while. And the notification sound you're hearing is also not a default notification sound. I customized that too. It's not really a Yoda thing, but I guess I can tell you where that is while we're waiting for all these apps to download. If we go to our Android settings here, uh, we can go to apps and notifications and then notifications and then advanced down at the bottom here. And there's an option called default notification sound. Um, and I loaded up a notification sound from an old iOS app called Pinger Text Free because I happen to think that that notification sound is less obnoxious than any of the current notification sounds that Android or Yoda are shipping by default. But once again, now that we're done with your typical nerd in the street sidebar, we can just wait here for a little while. Come on, Brave. You're the last one. Don't ruin the demo here. Well, we almost got through all the apps. We're hanging here on Brave. I don't know what the problem is. I'm connected to a Wi-Fi network. It, 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 this isn't a low signal. There's a cancel button, so it, it, we're still sort of in progress here, but I can't tell if we're downloading or not. Cancel, update all. I guess this is the value of, of actually showing you instead of just telling you about how well the Aurora store works because we catch things like this that, I've never had this problem before for the record. It's never stopped on the last app. When I've tapped update all, it has generally updated all. All right, cancel that again, come in here. What if we tap update from the app page? Okay, now it's downloading. You can see right here in the Brave change log, they're adding the ability in Brave Mobile to de-amp web pages, uh, which is cutting out the Google accelerated format that Google is trying to push. If you're anti-Google, which you might be, uh, if you're watching a video about Yode, you might want to take a look at Brave because they're also, uh, they are based on Chromium, but if you want de-googled Chromium, Brave is going to be more de-googled than anything else. All right, and hallelujah, that last one finished updating. So now we have no updates available in the Aurora store. If we tap this download button up here, we can see, oh, you can see the download history and it actually says we downloaded 100% of Brave uh, numerous times, each time saying that Brave was a, a different size. I don't know if you can see that. So that's weird, and I don't know why that just happened, but the Aurora Store updating, normally how I use this is I take a quick glance. I do want to see what apps I'm about to update, uh, but I don't necessarily read through the change logs for every single one. Some of them I do. Apps that I would be particularly sensitive to changes in, I might take a quick look at the change log, but then I just hit update all, I set the phone down, I come back later, they're all done updating. So. That's normally fine. Um, just to show you in comparison what Fdroid looks like since some apps on Yode come from Fdroid, we can update our repositories over there. Okay, so we don't have any updates available. I, I withheld updating anything on this phone for the past like two weeks. You saw how many updates I had from the Google Play Store. So I'm not going to wait for an app update to be available from Fdroid because that might take months. I wonder if I can go to my installed apps or go to an app I already have installed and simulate an update being available. Let's take open camera that I do have installed and let's grab an older version. I don't have the option to roll back. Do I? They all say installed. Uh, Yode, if I just search Yode, Yode browser versions. Okay, let's get an older version of the Yode browser. So I'll downgrade the browser app here, which is forked Firefox. Um, and I like that they're, they're rebranding it, or I don't mind that they're rebranding it. I do wish that they would give it more sane defaults. I got a, uh, a notification when the phone was pretty new saying, oh, make browser your default browser, which normally the notification says make Firefox your default browser. The notification read weird because they changed the name of the browser to just browser. Oh, and we can't even install it? I don't know why um, 
I, I, re I don't know why F-Droid would give me the option to downgrade if it's not actually going to work. We've got a one in the updates section now. Okay, so I've just broken F-Droid, as you can see. F-Droid is a little bit more of a rough experience, it, so it gave me the option to downgrade, let me download the downgraded package, but wouldn't let me install it because it's a downgrade. Now we've got a one badge on the updates section of the app if my camera can focus, there we go. But we're seeing that there are no updates available even though this says there's one update available. So F-Droid, not quite as nice. I think Aurora Store's GUI is a little bit better. So for the app updating experience, Aurora Store actually wins over Google Play for me, and that's great. The problem with using Aurora Store and not actually having Google Play installed is that some apps, particularly paid ones, don't work. I mentioned that one of the free camera apps that I tried didn't even launch because they detected that Google Play wasn't running, and that was not only a problem with camera apps. If you sign into your Google account, the Aurora Store front end will let you download any paid apps that you have purchased on Google Play, but in-app purchases will not work at all. Let me show you what this means. One of the first apps I tried to get working was Titanium Backup, which is an app that lets you backup and restore app data on a rooted phone. This used to be really useful for things like SMS text messages, phone call logs, and game save data. Titanium Backup is actually a little outdated at this point. As you can see, I've installed Swift Backup to replace it, but when I first got the phone, I tried Titanium first because I purchased a premium license for it years ago. It was around $5 from what I remember. Now I have the Pro Key installed, and if I open up Titanium Backup, you can see it just sits here at this checking license screen. Eventually it starts to complain that Google Play is taking too long to respond. It never moves on from this point by itself. If I try to bypass this, I can get to the menu. Um, if I cancel there, you can see it just launches with the free version set only. So the app does open up, but I can't use the premium features that I paid for, which include different types of backups, more granular controls, things like that. So this app is broken on Yode. Now I'll close that, and another app that I have installed here is called Kanji Draw. This is a kanji drawing app for practicing writing of Japanese characters with the proper stroke order. This app's data got reset from my old phone because I couldn't transfer the data over with titanium backup, but I figured, you know, that's just more practice, so it's fine. But in kanji draw, I actually purchased an in-app add-on to disable advertisements. If I go to the settings here, you can see there's a paid option, remove advertisements. Now if I click that, nothing happens. It just does absolutely nothing. Now what's funny about this is if we actually go and start using the app, and I'm probably gonna make myself look stupid here with stroke orders, but if we actually start using the app, you can see there are no advertisements here. Now the advertisement is supposed to show up at the bottom of the screen. I'm gonna complete another one of these. And when I finish this, watch the space at the bottom of the screen. You can see below all of the green, but above the three buttons at the bottom, there was that blank space. That is where the advertisement is supposed to show up. That's where it showed up on my old phone before I purchased that option. Yode's firewall is actually blocking the ads. So I can't buy the ad removal feature, but I still don't see ads. You might think that's a good thing. You're getting paid functionality for free. However, for one thing, you've got a blank space in the app that you can't remove, and a blank space is better than an ad, but it's still not great to have. And for another thing, you're also not supporting the app developer when you do that. Now I opened an issue on Yode's GitLab page for all three of the licensing issues I encountered in those different apps, and the response was, that's expected. They said that they, quote, prefer encouraging people to find alternatives. Now for a camera app, as you saw, there are a billion of those, so sure, find an alternative. But when it comes to kanji, for those of you not learning Japanese yet, there are thousands of characters, historically borrowed from Chinese and then modified over time, and every single one has a specific stroke order that you need to draw it in for it to be correct Japanese writing. An app that teaches stroke order for over 2,000 characters is not something that you can just replicate. Besides the system for checking the accuracy of your strokes and your stroke order, to program that kind of app, you need to know what all the correct stroke orders are. Obviously, those are recorded in other references, but, you know, that's information that is more than programming. And there are, of course, a few other options on the Google Play Store for this, but there are less free options than you might expect, and I personally like the layout of the Kanji Draw app best. And a bigger issue than just alternatives being available is supporting the developers. You know, I didn't have to hide ads the first time through, but this was a relatively quality app, and I appreciated that someone sat down and made it. So I spent the dollar or two to hide ads, and that is income for a human being somewhere. Now, I want to be careful not to turn this into a defending proprietary software segment, 
segment, the Yoday developers would probably say the same things I say about why you shouldn't use proprietary software, that the developer of this app shouldn't be including privacy intrusive ads in the first place, and that they should have published their hard work for free and then put up a Patreon page for optional donations instead, which is an argument I was a lot more sympathetic towards before I spent years of my life trying to get my own Patreon page off the ground. But really, what this comes down to, as far as Yoday is concerned, isn't even about the philosophy of developer support, it's about the fact that there are apps in the Aurora store that don't work. The Aurora store lets you download these apps and they do not open or they don't function as you would expect. That is a poor user experience and it is not something that most non-technical users would put up with if they're aware that they have an alternative. Now there's two other things that don't work here on Yode also to do with Google and they are Google Calendar and Google Contacts. Google Calendar actually works. If you install the Calendar app, it will sync your events over to the built-in Calendar app. But if you try to place the Google Calendar widget on your home screen, it never finishes loading. So you have to use the built-in AOSP Calendar widget instead, which I personally think looks worse. Now with Contacts, Google Contacts will just not sync to Yoday at all. You can literally install the Google Contacts app open it up, sign into it with your Google account, and it will sit there and tell you that you don't have any contacts, even though you can go to contacts.google.com in a web browser and see that you do. And the obvious answer to this is don't use Google Contacts or Google Calendar for that matter. And I've been wanting to get off of Google for these things for a few years now, and I did go ahead and take this opportunity to do that, but that was a huge hassle because I ended up going with Nextcloud for them, and Nextcloud kind of sucks for most of the things that it does. Now, I've made a lot of videos about Nextcloud, and it does a lot of things, but every single Nextcloud component is developed separately by people who say they're just volunteers, and they reject feature requests, and they add new features without ways to turn them off, and they have long-standing bugs that don't get fixed because they have arbitrary improvements they want to make first. I also set up an Edisync server as an alternative, and it was so close to being what I wanted since it just focuses on calendar and contacts and not a million other things like Nextcloud. But it also had some bugs, and its web interface was not feature complete with Nextcloud. There was no way to manage contact photos from the web interface. The calendar app didn't let you click and drag events, that kind of thing. So I went back to Nextcloud, but I'm not really confident it's not going to lose any of my contact data. Google Contacts has people I threw in there years ago without even thinking about the sync, while Nextcloud's contact app will lose data sometimes if I just save a change and then refresh the page. Now that's a lot of complaints about Nextcloud and Edisync, and why is that part of a Yoday review? Because this is a phone, it's a communication device, and it is absolutely useless if it does not contain the people you want to talk to in your contacts. And Yoday doesn't want to work with the Google stuff, so if you want to sync your contacts and calendar between devices, which you really should in case your phone breaks or is lost or stolen, then you will need to find an alternative like one of these. You'll need to make that decision of what other service to use, whether to set it up yourself or pay someone else to do it, all of that. And it's all because Yoday doesn't include Google Play services. Now Yoday's firewall, which I'm going to talk about more in a second here, it's baked into the OS, and honestly, I would prefer to have the Google Play services and then have the firewall block access to Google Play that isn't necessary. You get working apps in sync, you get a little bit more privacy. Now the Yoday devs wouldn't like that idea because their whole business model is getting people off of Google, but getting people off of Google is not as easy as just ripping Google out. You need to replace it with another service, which they haven't done and which is entirely outside of Yoday's business model. They're not a cloud company. So I've seen Yoday's developers reject the feature request to have optional Google Play services on their forums, and I would encourage them to rethink that decision because some users will absolutely jump through all of those hoops Maybe some won't even have to if they're already de-Googled, but you really are limiting your growth by making it really difficult for existing Android users to migrate onto your platform. So let's all go to a fantasy land where Nextcloud actually works the way it's supposed to, and Android actually supports it natively, and you've got the camera, calendar sync, and contact sync all working properly on your phone. This review is about Yoday OS as a whole, so what about the flagship app, Yoday itself? Well, the Yoday app is neat. That's basically how I describe it, it's neat. I've played with it a little bit. I've basically gone in there for one thing and that's to try turning it off for apps that aren't working. Aside from the list I've already mentioned, some banking apps don't work on Yoday OS. And it's funny, Yoday OS isn't actually rooted by default. I've rooted mine, but it's not rooted out of the box. 
but even if you don't root it, some apps will still detect the OS as being rooted. I saw this with Zoho Mail. So you get the worst of both worlds out of the box. You can't do things that require root because it's not rooted, but some apps think you have root, so you can't use them either. Now Zoho Mail still works, it was just giving a warning, but the big one that tends to not work on rooted devices are banking apps. You can find forum threads about this on Yode's website, and once again, their answer is find an alternative banking app, which translates to find an alternative bank, which translates to change the primary holder of your life savings because our OS doesn't work as expected, which is BS. Now my personal bank app does work on Yode, but another bank app that I use, the Uphold app, does not work. By the way, I would not recommend that anyone use Uphold as your bank, they are terrible, but I basically had to sign up to get funds out of the Brave Creators program a while back, so I do have an account that I need to keep using for now. And when I try to sign in to Uphold, whether I use the correct credentials or the incorrect credentials, I just get an immediate something went wrong error message, which is obviously not a very helpful error message on Uphold's part. So when this kind of thing happens on Yode OS, here's what I try. I open up the Yode app, And that's going to take a second to load in here, loading those statistics. I'm not sure why that actually takes that long to load because all that it's saying is how many applications I have installed and then how many I've set to reinforced manually. So that's not even reporting anything about statistics for communication. Uh, but what I do is I go over here to my stream and in here I usually look and see if there's anything from the app that I was trying to use. Now, as you can see, there's nothing here from Uphold. I can go back over to Uphold tap sign in again. Theoretically, this should be sending out some sort of communication if I'm tapping that button, but over here in the firewall, oh, well now I do have a couple of things, uh, but as you can see, the lights here are blue. So let's talk about this firewall app while we're here. I know this isn't going to fix the Uphold app because blue means it was allowed. The firewall app is cool to have around. It is a little confusing in its UI. Um, if you don't know what this color means, because red for blocked and green for allowed would be much more clear, uh, but a blue dot, meaning that this was an allowed communication, that's not entirely intuitive. If you don't know what that means, if you tap on this to try and see what it means, you get an option to authorize this domain for uphold, or you get an option to block it for uphold. Now, if this was allowed already, you should really only get the option to block. And if it was already blocked, you should only get the option to allow. You know, I can tap authorize for uphold. Now it's got this C next to it that I assume stands for customized or something like that. I can come back over to uphold, it still doesn't work. But yeah, it is confusing. Uh, at this point, since we have manually allowed it, we only get the option to either block for all apps or unauthorized for uphold. Um, so if we quote unquote unauthorize, it's not blocked yet. It's just no longer explicitly authorized. Now we can come in here again and block it. Um, and once again, so we can't go directly from blocking for a particular app to allowing or vice versa. You need to go back to neutral uh, before you can switch from one side to the other for a particular app. Um, we can do the same thing for all apps. We can authorize it for all apps. So it's customized and there's a G for global. Um, and then once again, we cannot immediately block it for all apps. We have to unauthorize for all apps. Then we have to block for all apps. And if it's blocked for all apps, we can still authorize for uphold. If it's authorized for all apps, we can still block it specifically for uphold. Um, so that part makes sense, but yeah, you should really, you should only be getting an option to do one or the other in my opinion. Like if this is allowed by default, I understand the concept from a firewall point of view of explicitly authorizing, but what Yode has is a blacklist of domains that are known to be trackers. So with the Yode firewall app in particular, it uses an implicit allow. So if that's the case, I think it would be a much more user-friendly experience if you only showed the authorize button uh, if it was already blocked, or only show authorize for uphold if it was blocked for all apps something like that. While we're here in the firewall app, we can also take a look at the other pages. As you can see, we get a report uh, that breaks down by app exactly what connections were allowed and denied. Now uphold, since I customized it, uh, you can see that there's a C next to uphold, so I can tap on that. And you can see I did go through when this wasn't working earlier, when I was actually using the phone, I went through and manually allowed a couple of the domains that were blocked by default. The rest of these were allowed by default. And once again, if we tap on any of these domains in here, let's say uphold.com, I can authorize that for uphold even though it's already allowed by default. I can block it for uphold. I can do the same thing for all apps. And once again, the ones that I've manually authorized for uphold, I can still block it for all apps. Interestingly, I can't explicitly authorize it for all apps. So that is also inconsistent. 
consistent. If you're going to let me explicitly authorize something that was only authorized by default, then why would authorizing it for a particular app mean that I'm no longer able to do that globally? Um, if I unauthorize for uphold, you can see, actually, I'm not sure, I can't even see if this would be allowed or denied by default. Um, it just, it's under the blue dot allowed because it was allowed, presumably because I manually allowed it. But yeah, the user experience for blocking and allowing things manually, not always the easiest to understand. The stream is helpful because it typically will show an entry if the Yode firewall is actually interfering with an app working. And in that case, you can presume that it's going to be blocked. Um, if it's actually blocking something, you can go and allow it. And as you can see, the stream does update in real time. So I can see, you know, Facebook Messenger is continuously sending things in the background. I know it doesn't have access access to my location when I'm not using that app. Uh, but you know, you can see the little pings, you know, Twitter, I never use the Twitter app on my phone. I do not use that Twitter app really for anything except every now and then I'll open a link from Reddit in the Twitter app to view a post that somebody linked to and then I'll go back to the web browser where I was browsing Reddit. And yeah, Facebook Messenger, I, I use it sometimes, but I'm not actively using it right now and you know, it's neat to be able to see this stuff if you do wanna go ahead and block some of that. For instance, let's say that I don't want Twitter uh, talking to Twitter all the time when I'm not using it. I can go through and I can block a bunch of these Twitter connections um, and you know, that might actually interfere with the operation of the Twitter app. I'd be interested actually if I open Twitter up right now, what will happen? So the Twitter app at this point, uh, now it's just sitting here loading, not actually getting any tweets. And if we come back over to the firewall, um, well, we don't have any blocked connections logged here. So maybe it's just Twitter not wanting to load. See, this seems like something that the firewall would have broken. There we go. If we come back over to the stream, there's a little delay, but now you can see these gray items. Once again, I think this would be more clear if it was red. Maybe they don't want to imply that blocking something is bad necessarily, and that's why they went with gray, but gray is very neutral uh, to me. But yeah, as you can see, we do have all of those gray blocked connections, and if we want uh, Twitter to actually work, I can go through and unblock all of those, and then if we go over to Twitter, then it will actually load, and it's giving me an updated terms of service. And an NFT pop-up. <laughs> like I said, I, I do not use Twitter at all. My last tweet was over six months ago. But yeah, that's fun. You can play with this and see that it is actually blocking connections when you tell it to. Uh, one other feature in the firewall app is this map. And the map is interesting because it doesn't actually provide that much value here. As you can see, broken down by connection, I, I still don't know what these units are. K-O-M-O-O. -O -O. Not sure what those units are, but this is sorted by unit. I can tell that much. And the most common place, the most common location for apps to try and contact, since I am using a lot of US-based services, living in the US, the United States is the top in the list. And then the second most contacted is undefined. So connections that they are not even sure where they're coming from, which includes Uphold. Uphold I know is in uh, the UK. Discord should probably be sorted under US. But despite all of that, the map defaulted to France. It always defaults to France because that's where Yode is. Um, I would highly recommend that they at least make an effort to center the map wherever the most common connections are. Uh, because, I mean, France, I'm not sending anything really to or from France other than, I mean, F-Droid, that's probably contacting Yode's repository that they have configured. And beyond that, this map really, I mean, it's not interactive. You cannot tap these, these icons to really do anything or go anywhere. Um, and you can't tap the icons in the lists to go over to the location on the map. Um, you can resize this to make the map a little bit bigger. And then if we make it big enough, then it just stops loading altogether. So that's also something that is a little bit broken uh, from a UI UX standpoint. But yeah, the map, it, it seems like this could be more useful. Maybe if it was also more specific than just country, because I mean, US, this doesn't tell me a whole lot. Of course, where your servers are located that you're talking to um, doesn't actually matter that much. I guess if it's crossing international borders, then some governments might be collecting more information about it. So maybe that's why they only break it down by country. But yeah, that, that's the map page. And you can also see that for the last seven days or for all time. You can see even for all time, 
more than seven days ago, it looks like I've talked to Canada, oh, or I guess more than one day ago. But yeah, the vast majority of my connections, once again, staying within the US. And if I go back over to stream and then map, I don't even have to exit the app, it just defaults back to France. So that's a quirk. Um, over here in the settings app, we do have a list of customized protections. So this will show you in one place everything that you have customized, but it also shows you everything that's not customized. This would be useful if I could sort by customized. Can I? Show only customized recipients, there we go. So you can come in here if you want to review your customizations, make sure that any whitelists that you've put in there are still actually needed. Then you can easily do that. Um, if I exit out, yeah, it just defaults to showing everything. I would recommend probably that they default to only showing things that you've customized because that's the point of a customized page. Um, this, this page is not called all transmissions. It's just called customized protection. So it, it should show customized protection by default. But it does show you all of those so that you can go through and allow or deny. I think all of these are for uphold, attempting to get uphold to work, yeah. I have not had the need to make any other customizations besides that. Uh, we can also go in here to protection selection, and I think there was one app that I marked as reinforced. Oh, it's the very first one, Obstruct. Yeah, so Obstruct, like I mentioned uh, earlier, it's a wallpaper app, and a wallpaper app really should not ever need to go and talk to any server other than when I'm actively downloading a wallpaper. Um, at this point, I've got the wallpaper set, I could just uninstall it, I kinda, I'm keeping it around, uh, but I really don't want that app doing anything, and so I set it to reinforced just kind of for fun. Now the reinforced mode, uh, you can actually tap on the three dots and it gives you some categories and the categories really are not very self-explanatory. We've got socials, uh, which I assume means social media of some kind, uh, keeping the app from being able to talk to social media. We've got uh, a pornography category and then an extreme category. And I'm wondering if these are separate, what extreme actually covers. I can't really, I can't long tap on those to see what they do. I can turn one on or off. But yeah, the firewall app as a whole, um, it does it does work. The UI is a little quirky, but once again, I do, I like what they're doing here. Um, and there is a button you can very easily just turn off all protection if you want to quickly troubleshoot something or you can turn it all back on. It also does show you the number of blocked requests so that you know if it's actually worth having on your device, exactly how much it's doing for you, that kind of thing. So this firewall app, it's got a few UI quirks, but it's still pretty neat. It's great that it's there. It makes me feel a lot more comfortable throwing new apps on the phone. One of the other Yode components I replaced was the keyboard. The default Yode keyboard doesn't support entering Japanese at all, and it also doesn't have swipe typing, which is a feature I use a ton. I tried out the Microsoft keyboard, didn't really like it as much, especially for multilingual input, so I ended up installing the Google keyboard like I had on my previous Android phone. And I'd obviously normally have privacy concerns about that, but on Yode, I can go in, I can set that app to restricted, I can see what request it's making, and be somewhat confident that at least less data about what I'm typing is going to Google compared to when I was using the same keyboard on my previous phone. Now with all of that said, there is one major flaw of the Yode app. It's proprietary. It's closed source, which really blows my mind. These people are fighting against Google and any independent app developer that relies on Google out of principle, but they don't open source their code? They've addressed this online in a couple of places and it's the same stuff you hear from a lot of developers. We think our idea is the most valuable thing in the world and we don't wanna risk someone stealing it, so we'll consider going open source later, maybe if we get really popular first. Now I'm not just bagging on this because I like open source software, I am bagging on this because it completely undermines everything Yode is doing. You cannot trust this firewall. They say you can use a network analyzer to confirm that requests are actually being blocked, and you could, and you could also use a network analyzer to check what Google's sending on a regular Android phone, or just use a firewall on your network to block that traffic instead. I mentioned in my unboxing video for this phone that Apple is the poster child for why you can't trust proprietary software even when the people making it say that they're pro-privacy. Yode is based in France, they brag about being bound by French privacy laws, and based on what I know about France's legal system, I would certainly never want to live there, and I would not trust their privacy laws any more than the rest of the EU's. And if they pass a law next year about CSAM, or terrorism, or public health and safety, or any number of other things, Yode would either have to comply with that, or not comply, and completely invalidate any of their arguments about proprietary software from France being trustworthy because of their laws. Now, I've talked about a number 
of proprietary apps and services that I use or that I tried to use on this phone, and I am not denying that there would be a huge audience for a proprietary firewall app baked into an Android distribution. But what really baffles me is that the audience for a proprietary firewall app is going to want to use proprietary apps and services on their phone. And the people who you're actually convincing, the people who will switch away from Google and will boycott app developers depending on Google services, the people who do that are the same ones who will boycott you. Use proprietary stuff or don't. There are arguments on both sides of that, but Yode being so negligent toward all of this breakage plus being closed source at the same time just means that they're killing their audience. Let me break it down this way. I can't recommend Yode OS to a regular user on the street because a lot of proprietary stuff doesn't work, but I can't recommend it to a paranoid user either because someone paranoid won't trust a proprietary app. So who exactly is Yode's target audience? I'm really not sure. I think that their target audience is the paranoid crowd, and I think that not open sourcing their app so far is an oversight on their part. I think that Yode OS as a whole is really a fragmented experience. It feels like a hodgepodge of third-party components thrown together. Lots of third-party branding and verbiage like we saw with the Aurora Store, patch weirdness like we saw with Open Camera, bloat like we saw with Mozilla Pocket's top stories being enabled by default in the web browser, even though they renamed the app by default. It all comes together to form a really rough experience. Now, one last thing that I didn't mention earlier because it's not too involved with Yode is that once again, they don't root the phone by default. And if you want to root the phone, you'll probably have to flash third-party software from recovery. Yode uses a fork of the Lineage OS recovery, which has great integration for OS updates. But for some reason in their fork, Yode specifically disabled the feature that lets you override the safety function and flash unsigned software. So you actually can't root the phone without also replacing Yode's recovery and replacing the recovery also makes the OS updates more manual. So it's like they're trying to cater only to non-power users with these overly tight safety functions while having lots of trade-offs that only power users would know how to work around. So my verdict for this review, Yode is neat. It's a cool project. I am glad they exist. I currently would not recommend using them. Once they open source their firewall app and any other components they haven't open sourced yet, then I would recommend them to any user who runs their own self-hosted cloud solutions and doesn't mind putting up with some rough edges in exchange for better privacy. That is, if you use one of the phones that they support, or if you happen to live in the EU, which is the only place they sell phones. But do be aware that they've stated they only guarantee support for a phone one year after you buy it, and even then they hedge their bets by saying that's just what they try to do. So this review did not go entirely smoothly, but I do want to thank Yode for putting themselves out there and contacting me. I think that shows a lot in terms of trustworthiness, at least as far as seeking out accurate reviews goes. And I hope that this in-depth look was informative for anyone out there considering Yode. If you have any questions or suggestions about anything that I said, put them down in the comments section on YouTube, Dailymotion, or NerdOnTheStreet.com. And you can also find links to the Nerd on the Street IRC server and the Knots Discord server in the description below. I'm Jacob Kauf, and I'm the Nerd on the Street, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.